It's no name never. No name never no more shall I fall free to hackers. No never no more. And so SIP Oasis, we've come to retain our network they manage. All right, let me make sure we got audio checks. This is the awkward part of the show. Just make sure everything's working right. Thank you. So I appreciate you all being here this morning. And we're going to talk about the difference between uh, complacence and compliance, because that's really where the rubber meets the road in this whole world. And if I can get the clicker out of my pocket. So. In 1992, thanks to poor compliance practices, practices, in fact, downright complacence of the Russian Navy, I was able to infiltrate a submarine. I was uh, studying in St. Petersburg, Russia. I was learning Russian language at the time. And uh, there was a, a Russian naval holiday going on. And so we rented a little boat. You could do that for about five bucks, 10 bucks. I don't even remember how much it cost. And go put putt up and down the Neva River. We pull up alongside this submarine. And they, they never saw us coming because uh, we used just the classic, classic attack vector to use a fancy cybersecurity word, vodka. Um, I pulled up alongside, said, hey, guys, can we come aboard? We've got vodka. They said, hell yeah, come on, let's do this. And we got a grand tour of the submarine, saw the command and control thing. And when we were even um, going through and seeing the crew quarters, we had bunk beds up on the sides, and I swear to God, in the aisle on a little uh, wooden chair was one of those 80s TV VCR combos. And I swear to God, they were watching Hunt for Red October <laughs> in Russian subtitles. So I got, we were all laughing about Sean Connery's accent, had a good time with that. And then when I was about ready to make my move and take over the sub, I, uh, I hit my head. And I realized subs were not built for people that are 6'3", so I spared them all. Um, otherwise, I'd have a sub down at the beach for the summer conference, and we could all go for a ride. But anyway, they were complacent, and they almost got in a lot of trouble and caused an international incident. So very similarly, I'm on war. I've declared war on complacence, and that's what I want everybody to pick up on. So wild guess here, who, for a four-pack of beer that I forgot to bring down, <laughs> for a four-pack four of beer, what state has the highest per incident loss per cyber event. Anyone? Can I get a roll tied? <laughs> we are the worst, or the best, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> $50,000 per incident on average. And that's on average. So that's all of your Amazon gift cards and all of those things. And the national average is 13,000. Number two is New York, and it's half better than us. And to me, I view that as an outright indictment of my industry, because we all know that people are going to become victims. And it's supposedly our job as the tech people to teach people how not to fall prey to these threats. But the problem is, how, much, how many of you consume cyber, sec cyber technology information on a regular basis? Watch it on YouTube or whatever. Some of you more than I would have expected. Most of that stuff is excruciating. I can't even watch it. I mean, I would rather rub sand in my eyes than watch most of these things because it's technical. It's more designed for me than for you. And so I would submit that people are confused or they get scared. And when they're confused and they're scared, they shut down. They don't learn. So the hackers are getting better every month, every year, and the normal people are not. So. What I've done to that is I invented this thing called cyber technology, which is cyber technology with an LOL in the middle. And we do our best to get people entertained. I call it intertraining, where we are teaching them using entertaining means. So they're accidentally learning things, but they're making themselves safer. For instance, I use haikus. You might know what a haiku is. It's a Japanese poem. It has five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. So we use that as a catchy way to teach people on things like multi-factor authentication or whatnot. And you have little videos that people can consume. Um, this year, I have an album that's going to be dropping, uh, an album of cybersecurity parody songs. So again, this is one of the proudest moments that I've had. I, I sent 
a buddy of mine, the hackers went back to Russia, which is a cover of the Charlie Daniels song. Hacker went back to Russia looking for you know, that land of opportunity. And he called me up and said, I listened to your song, and I went and I turned multi-factor authentication on every account that I have. And I'm like, oh my god, it's working. So that's one of the fundamental tenets. And we also have other things. The secure urinal, I call it, which is a little plaque that we put above the urinal in the bathroom or on the back of the <laughs> ladies' stalls. And you know, on the cybersecurity insurance forms, they want to know how often are you training your, your people on cybersecurity hygiene. <laughs> now you can answer every time they pee. <laughs> but to get into it, I'm taking my format for today is going to be sort of a, I'm calling it an inverse uh, Clint Eastwood. Instead of the good, bad, and the ugly, we're going bad, ugly, good. Um, I know that's not exactly backwards or for those of you with OCD and caught up on it, but give me a break. <laughs> so who's heard of Change Healthcare? Anybody? Oh, wow, huh? How many of you are like in the middle of hell because of Change Healthcare? It's getting worse and worse. Um, we were talking with people last night. I couldn't believe there. One, one lady couldn't make this conference because, or couldn't make this talk because she had to have a call with all of her doctors explaining to them why they're not getting paid. And she was not looking forward to that conversation. So this is really bad, and it's bad for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the scale and the scope. I mean, the, the things are getting bigger, and they're getting bigger. Y'all already know, I'm sure, 15 billion transactions per year run through Change Healthcare, um, and a third of the US patient records go through Change Healthcare. They're connected to 900,000 doctors, 33,000 pharmacies, 5,500 hospitals. So this is a big deal in terms of just the impact of it and the scope. How it started, there's a thing called a bug bounty program. So if you're a software company and you make software, you want to find out that there's something wrong with it before the bad guys do or before the general public does. So they have things called a bug bounty program where people who are like uber nerds, they eat twink, live on Twinkies and Tab and then live in the basement and love nothing more than just beating on computers, they get paid commission to find bugs in software. So they're always sort of like being good guys. It's kind of like having a penetration test, which is something that we're offering at our, uh, at our booth, which also makes the HIPAA folks and cybersecurity folks happy. But on February 19th, this is the timeline I really want you all to pay attention to. On February 19th, it was announced that this piece of software had a vulnerability that they had discovered. And they announced it to everywhere, told everybody, patch all of your stuff. And then on the 21st, Change Healthcare was already hit. It was too late. Not even 48 hours from the very first inkling that there was a problem to bad guys in the wild using it to wreak all of this havoc. So it used to be we had plenty of time to between, uh-oh, there's a problem, and somebody actually doing something with it. It's getting faster and faster. And part of that is because also the bad guys who did it. Black Cat is a ransomware gang. Anybody heard of Black Cat? Yeah, they make the news a lot. What they are is sort of like an eBay for ransomware. They're a ransomware as a service. Everything is as a service now, right? So why not ransomware? So what that means is they will offer all of their technology, all of their tools. They have a whole cybercrime syndicate behind them, and they offer that free to the general public. So if any of you want to become a hacker, all you have to do is you can go find Black Cat online. They'll give you all the stuff that you need to wreak hell on people. Off you go, and then when you collect the money, they'll process the transaction for you, give you 90% of the proceeds, and keep 10% for themselves. So in reality, it wasn't even Black Cat people doing it. We don't know who the hell it was. But it was somebody who was using Black Cat. And what's the most interesting little wrinkle that I saw yesterday is uh, it appears that Change Healthcare paid about a $24 million ransom to Black Cat. And then Black Cat has announced that they're shutting down. And the supposition is that they ain't going to pay out that 90% to whoever's got it coming, and they're just going to evaporate. But we shall see. Another thing that this one really makes me kind of want to yellow my lab coat a little bit, because <laughs> the software that we're talking about is software that I use. It's software in my company. Um, there are two, the Coke and Pepsi of the IT world are two companies called ConnectWise and Kaseya. There's no reason you should know that. But they're the Coke and Pepsi of our world. And a couple of years ago, Kaseya got breached. And ConnectWise was the way that Change Healthcare got breached. So we subscribed to all these things as a service. So as soon as ConnectWise was alerted to the problem, they patched their hosted stuff, which is what we use. But the people who weren't, they're in trouble. 
So again, I'm a lot like y'all. Everybody says, it's not gonna happen to me. I'm not a target. I don't have anything anybody wants. Wrong. You are a target. And I know damn well that I'm a target because we get fished like crazy because they know if they get me, they get you, right? So Colonial Pipeline, everybody remembers Colonial Pipeline and that all hit us really hard. But this is, to quote this guy, Carter Groom from First Health, First Health Advisory, this is healthcare's colonial pipeline moment. And while I think that makes everybody sit up a little bit, I don't like that very much because I feel it feeds into people's uh, bias of the, it's not gonna happen to me, I'm not a target, I'm too small. Oh sure, they're going after colonial pipeline. Oh sure, they're going after change healthcare. That's not at all the case. They're going after everybody. They have very wide nets and they don't care who they get. And it's mostly small people like you and like us that are the ones that are getting popped and you're not gonna read about it in the news. Um, so to that, we wanted to bring it up, make this very real. Ryan is uh, kind enough, kind enough to uh, take us through. They had a, an, an event themselves and I really appreciate in the interest of disclosure because again, we screw complacency, right? We got to blow that up. So I felt it was really important for y'all to hear from one of your own what happened. So uh, take them through it. Right, right. Y'all hear me? All right. Who has gone through a ransomware attack before? One. All right. Two. Good. Y'all are in the right place then because you need to know about this. So uh, 2018, September, of two, September 20th of 2018, um, one of our business office people that gets there early in the morning says, I can't get in. The screen says, all of your data is encrypted and locked and you need to contact this, whatever it was, to um, pay us some money. So at that point, and I'm kind of just going to go through the timeline of my perspective and uh, just so you kind of know if, as an administrator how it kind of unfolds because um, it's maybe a little bit different than you hear on the news. So at that point, you contact your IT company. Um, you need to think, of, I'm going to give you some points of things you need to think about. Do, has your IT company ever dealt with ransomware or any type of cyber attack before? Most of them do not have experience in it. They're good at help desks, they're good at you know, uh, adding new services, managing servers, but do they have anything in, in, their, uh, uh, in their services uh, re regarding ransomware attacks? Um, ours did not, they had never dealt with one before, so they did not know really what to do. All right, so you start with that. We can't do anything, well, obviously we can't log in. Now we contact our insurance company. So um, everybody in here I assume has cybersecurity insurance. Um, there are different levels of insurance that you can get. So we'll go through a couple of those things. Um, so what happens is you contact your insurance company and they have multiple vendors that they use that work to, to mitigate and remediate whatever issue there is. They're, you know, whoever you use has a bench of groups they use. It's not just one company, typically. We were given a group. We didn't know anything about them. They then contact the hackers and start the process. They were in China. So you make contact. 12 hours go by before they respond. So we lost 12 hours. This was on a Thursday. So we lost the whole day, basically, <laughs> just trying to get them to respond. So they respond, tell us where to send, I think ours was $78,000. Pay the ransomware. Do, uh, Google, if you want to, Atlanta, City of Atlanta, t March of 2018. They did not pay the ransomware. It was $50,000. Cost them $17 million, and they were down for two months. Um, City of Atlanta. Pay the ransom. Your insurance, definitely, that should be covered under that. I don't know if it'll have a cap, but definitely that part should be covered under your, your cybersecurity insurance. All right, so we get... I believe, all right, so we get to Saturday, Friday, complete wasted day. We uh, have to wire money from our bank to this vendor who then t converts it to Bitcoin and sends it to China. That's another 12 to 24 hour process, all right? We get to Saturday and the insurance, or the uh, vendor we were using decides they don't really want to respond to us on the weekend. Um, I have to fire this company and ask our broker for another company to help us come in and deal with the rest of this. So all this company did was basically pay the ransomware and I had to get a new vendor 
called Silence, who was fantastic. So if you are looking, if you want to ask your cybersecurity um, uh, insurance company who they're using, Silence would be a good one. Um, so they come in, have to figure out, all right, now we paid them. They're going to unencrypt our data. That's just the start. So we, um, how our system worked, everything was internal. We were not in a data center. All that's changed now. Uh, everything was on site. We did uh, do backups remotely, but we had a on-site servers, a backup on-site, which also got encrypted, so that you could not restore from that backup. And the only way you could have gotten your data back was to restore from a remote backup, which could take a week. How many terabytes of data do you have in your, uh, on your servers? And to, to restore remotely would require you to do it through the internet, and that takes a long time. So um, we paid the ransom. They start unencrypt unencrypting the data. At that same time, this company is now trying to figure out where did it come from, where is it, how do we get it out of our system, and what do we need to do to make sure it never comes back. It, so we start unencrypting data on Sunday. It takes at least 24 hours for all of that data to be, all, all those files to be back to normal, and there are some that were corrupted. Um, then they, you know, so we found out it was from an email, this is typical phishing deal, and a Facebook email to our marketing person. Um, another thing that this kind of 101 on phishing is do not use your corporate email for anything outside of work. So that, you know, if you get an email from Facebook and you use your corporate email, you probably think, oh, that's legit or whatever, or Amazon or anything. Bad idea. We obviously now we don't let people do that. Um, so she clicked on an email. They were in our system. They looked for at least a week and a half before they did anything. They looked at everything. They looked at our financials. They knew how much they would ask for um, based on your company. Um, they also found other ways to get in. Another thing I would recommend is um, there's kind of an old school thing called Team Viewer where um, outside vendors like your EMR can come in and get on your servers and fix things. Um, if they have open access to that, and they just are putting in a username and password to get in your servers to fix things. That's, they, those are normally pretty easy ones for them to find out those passwords. That's another way they can get in and, and get to your servers. So now you have to contact our IT company to get access into our system. Any vendor does. So it's, it's not open access like it was before. So I'd highly recommend if you don't have that to do that as well. All right, so they get our data's back. They want to make sure it's gone. Um, so they've fixed the problem, uh, and now we need to make sure it never happens again. Our cyber insurance at that time, and I know it's more sophisticated now, I know we pay a lot more now than we did five, six years ago for cyber security insurance. Make sure your policy has remediation cost involved. So they paid, they paid the ransom, they paid us uh, to, they paid all the IT fees to fix the problem, but then what they're gonna tell you is all your servers are no good anymore. You need to replace them all. You need to replace everything that it could possibly be on so that it can never come back. If you don't have that cost covered in your cyber insurance, they ain't paying it, and that is a very expensive piece to this puzzle. Ours was $400,000, so um, we also have business interruption insurance, so if y'all have that, we were able to file a claim for that. We were able to, you know, get a couple of days worth of MRIs and office visits and claim that. That helped offset um, some of that cost for the hardware. Um, so the remediation part is just as important, and at that point, we moved everything off-site, so everything's in a data center, um, and then it's backed up remotely to another data center somewhere else. So it's completely siloed from our network. I'm not saying, now they, if they hack into the data center, that's a bigger problem like one of, the, you know, one of these we're talking about. But at least you know, it's not on site with our, with our stuff. So, um, so it, we went from Thursday, so we lost three business days. You can do nothing. You, can't, you can answer the phone and tell people you can't do nothing for them. You can't schedule appointments, you can't bill your, uh, EMR doesn't work, your practice management doesn't work, your x-ray, you know, you can't, it can't talk to anything. So it, it's literally like, you know, your building just burnt down for three, ours was three business days. Um, so my take home is look at your policy, 
see what, uh, see what all is included in it, uh, you cannot <laughs> cheap out on, on that. Because uh, once you go through one of these, you're going to end up getting everything possible you could get covered in your, uh, on your policy. And then I would make sure your IT company um, is well versed in at least dealing with other people that vendors that are experienced with this. And then also ask your insurance company what vendors do you use um, if something were to happen. Because normally you just sign it and you just trust that it's a good policy. But not all uh, vendors are equal when it comes to dealing with it. So that's my two cents. Hopefully that was enough for that. Yeah, okay. that's fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. Let's have a, a round of applause for, for, for our candor. Thank you. So, and that's actually one of the happiest endings that we get to hear in, in this world. Three days is not that bad. Average is often two weeks. So uh, take that and compound it. But to his point, this is one of the statistics that bugs me too. 91% of cyber attacks start with a phishing email. You know, and that's, we're, we're, that's not really much of a surprise. We're used to that. The thing that blows my mind is still 19.8% of employees will click on a link in a phishing email. And if that's all it takes, you know, the marketing person probably didn't have access to all the EMR data because that wasn't her job, but they're still able to land on the network, spread, and get everything they needed, even though it was not, you know, it wasn't the CEO that got hacked, it was just a, a marketing person, but it didn't matter. Um, and to that point, we're watching the word world burn. I, I like that quote because that's one of the top guys in cybersecurity and they're the ones who are going, holy crap, we used to have time to deal with these things, and now we're seeing them happen in the wild. Things that are making it worse, the other talk in there is the AI talk. I kind of wish it had been at a different time so I could check it out. Cameron's a great, uh, a great speaker. Um, but they have AI now. So I put this into chat GPT. It wouldn't do it for me because it has ethics, but the hacker's AI does not. It was easy, I gave it my LinkedIn profile page, I gave it my Facebook profile page. I say, scrape my entire profile, scrape the profile of every contact that I have on LinkedIn. Scrape my Facebook profile, and the same for every friend I have on Facebook. And then using that information, I want you to send me the perfect phishing email that I'm gonna click on no matter what, because it's gonna be about my kid, it's gonna be about my dog, it's gonna be about the concert I'm gonna see next week. They know it's getting worse, and if the only thing that you're your only activity is, I'm smart enough not to click on things, you're gonna get popped, because you gotta have things, what if, what if, what if. Another tool they have, who's heard of the dark web? So dark web, more or less, is like a collaboration platform for these bad guys. So if you wanna buy heroin, kitty porn, credit card numbers that work, or legitimate medical records, dark web is where you go to do it. Um, and I ran myself through it, and these are password hits that I had on my personal email account. I've changed them all. This was, these were from a long time ago. But back in 2016, I was like, y'all. I mean, I had the same password on a lot of different accounts. It was my son's name. I figured nobody would ever guess that, right? <laughs> and then when we first started looking into this, I'm like, holy crap. Because now, this is why you have to have a unique password on every single account that you have. Because it's not necessarily about you. It's about them, too. So if I have... My LinkedIn password is the same password as the bank. LinkedIn's already been breached. They already got all those passwords. So now all they have to do is guess your bank. And there's only about 3,000 of those, so that doesn't take much time. So if you like, we ran, if you were registered for the conference, we ran a, a dark web report on you and uh, have it available at, the, at our booth. So if you want, come and see what you showed. Uh, we've got a report waiting on you. <laughs> so now let's get into the ugly. So, he didn't have to deal with the ugly, thank God. Um, the ugliest part about your world is that in many cases, the actual ransomware event is the best part, <laughs> if that makes sense. Because you're not gonna get hit once. You're gonna get hit by the ransom. You're gonna get hit by loss of operating income. Then you have to notify everybody. Then the feds are gonna come in and perform their audits. And if they find anything that you weren't doing, they're going to levy fines. And then the class action lawyers are coming too. So, I mean, y'all are just getting it over and over and over again. And it's, it's not fair. Um, Department of Justice now is going after false claims. Um, used to be false claims was like 
I'm a contractor, I build rockets and I'm ripping off the government and one of my employees can whistleblow on me. Now they're viewing, if you take Medicare, every time that you certify your annual Medicare renewal, you are attesting that you comply to all of the applicable laws, including HIPAA. Now their approach is, if you are not compliant with the laws of HIPAA, every single claim that you have made to Medicare is a false claim, you are ripping off the government. And what the False Claims Act does is enact a whistleblower statute. So who here has had a receptionist you had to fire for being on Facebook instead of answering the phone, right? We all have disgruntled employees. That disgruntled employee is one phone call away from calling the Department of Justice, calling in an action on you. They come in and do an investigation. And if you're not HIPAA compliant, the fine can be up to five years of your annual Medicare reimbursement. And then the worst part is that receptionist you fired for not doing her job gets 20%. It's very real. So there's a lot of money going around here. There's a lot of money flying around. And money attracts a lot of people. It attracts the bad guys, it attracts the hackers, but it also attracts the lawyers. So class actions are really the number one thing that I want y'all to defend yourselves from. Because the hackers are so good, maybe you can stop it, but you have to assume that you can't. So the moral of this story is HIPAA becomes your protection against these lawsuits. Um, I have a podcast, and we uh, did an interview with one of the attorneys at Pittman Dutton, um, who they were the ones who settled the class action lawsuit against Norwood Clinic. So again, these things are not just change healthcare, big companies elsewhere in the country. These things are happening here locally too. North Star Paramedic Services, class action lawsuit. Seat Cardiovascular Associates, class action lawsuit. Sheffield Group, this one's interesting, class action lawsuit, but they're not even a medical company. They're an insurance company. They do workman's, workers' comp. But it was medical records that were taken. And the HIPAA does not apply to the industry, it applies to the information. And they had medical records, and they face a class action now because they were complacent. So I put this up here because everybody remembers asbestos, right? So uh, we, we, we like crapping on the lawyers and whatnot, but at the end of the day, if you think about asbestos as an example, what was it that got asbestos out of the world? Lawyers. Mesothelioma. I mean, God, can you remember in the 90s, you couldn't turn on the TV without having six mesothelioma ads, and it's still one of the highest pay-per-click ad words on Google. So they're putting ads up there. Have you been injured? Do you have mesothelioma? Do you know somebody that has mesothelioma? Do you want mesothelioma, right? <laughs> Anything that can be divisible by half, they're gonna try to make a play for it. And now we're seeing these things, these billboards. Is your employer cheating Medicare? And that's the False Claims Act. So then when your receptionist sees this ad and goes, why yeah, I know they didn't do whatever they were supposed to do for HIPAA, I can get 20%. And there's a lot of lawyers that are lined up just to help you make that money. So again, we're getting to where if you're not compliant, you are complacent by default. And if you're complacent, the lawyers, are, the lawyers can't sue you for HIPAA, right? That's a regulatory thing. What the lawyers sue you for is gross negligence because ignorance of the law is not a defense. Um, you should have known, it's been around for an awful long time. And then implied contract, because how many of y'all have patients sign a HIPAA document that shows who you can disclose to? Implicit in them signing that is that you're holding up your end of the bargain on the other side too. If you're gonna hold them to HIPAA and you're representing yourself that you're compliant with HIPAA, that's an implied contract that you have with them that you are. And these are the things that the lawyers are coming after. So now, talk about getting stuck in the middle. We talked about the timeline of the hackers. The attorneys are on a very similar timeline because now, going back to this calendar for this is change healthcare again, 19th, it was announced, 21st, it happened, 23rd, class action lawsuit filed. So the hackers are monitoring the boards where people are expressing their vulnerabilities like they did on the 19th so then they can go after it. And the lawyers are monitoring the notifications that people are sending out so that they can be first in line to get in on the class action lawsuits. Y'all are literally, I mean, it's like hackers to the left of me, lawyers to the right, here I am, just sitting, waiting, to get screwed. <laughs> So this is another one, a children's hospital in Chicago. They announced February 5th, they were breached. February 6th, class action lawsuit. 
you know? And I've actually, I was very proud. I got, I got Shannara socks at a conference one time, and I'm like, I'm never gonna get to wear those. And so now I'm like, oh, I got a chance. So again, we're fighting complacence. So who's ready to go play in traffic now? You know? I'm gonna help you out a little bit because this is what it takes to do the cybersecurity piece of HIPAA. And that's supposed to freak you out, but you don't have to deal with that. That's our problem. But that is what it takes, but you don't have to worry about that. You need to look at HIPAA, <laughs> bless you, look at HIPAA as your legal defense. Um, my podcast is called Welcome to the HIPAA Dome, and it literally is a, a shield through which, in which you can hide and shelter yourself from the hackers and the lawyers who are coming. So your first job is to blow up complacence. Um, this is the thing that I can't do for you and that nobody can do for you. Um, in senior leadership, you have to accept that it's a real thing. Um, I put the five stages of grief up there because that's kind of what this is like for most people is in the very beginning, they're all like, it ain't gonna happen to me. This isn't real. Yeah, sure, big company. But once you go through all these things and hear what's really happening in the wild, you gotta get to that acceptance. And until the senior manager, the owners of the business, the people who understand that they own the risk, until they're on board with it, then nothing else is going to change. Next, we gotta work with your staff. Your staff has to do the same thing, so it, it trickles down. If the staff doesn't care, it doesn't matter what you do, it's not gonna work, right? And that's where we try to come in with cyber technology to make it to where it's not so mind-numbingly boring that people wanna chew their arm off and kill themselves, but they learn. And then the last part is work with pros to establish a HIPAA process. Documentation is the key. Um, we have a, a partner of ours, I've been showing the, 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 the compliance group, um, he'll be at our booth um, today. But the documentation is key because government, what does the government wanna see? They always wanna see paperwork, right? And what's the first thing a lawyer asks for when they show up with a, with a suit? Discovery, right? So if you respond to a discovery request with a uh, then that's gonna be a very bad lawsuit. If you respond to a discovery request with banker's boxes showing your six years of, of log records, all of the files that you're required to keep by HIPAA, six years worth, print it out, give them 16 banker's boxes, tell them to have a nice day, you're never gonna hear from them again because that's too expensive. It costs them too much money to read all that paperwork. And if you've got all that, you're probably not grossly negligent. So these are the things that are gonna help you. Um, so if you wanna know what it takes, HIPAA is complicated, but we make it as simple as we can. This is a checklist that we've got, it's free. If you like, um, pull your phone up, you can scan that and download it, but it talks about all of the, there's six audits that you have to run every single year. And you have to have all six years of those saved. So if you're missing, if you're missing an audit, then you're giving them grounds for negligence. Because the good thing about all this is HIPAA, when we think compliance, we think perfection. And then we get overwhelmed, like, oh my God, there's no way that we can comply with all of that stuff. And the good news is HIPAA regulations, they realize this too. They realize that we're all normal, we're all first and foremost trying to take care of our patients, but all they wanna see is progress. So when you run that first assessment, if you've never done one before, guess what, it's gonna suck. And they all do, and that's okay. So you publish your assessment, you go, hey look, we suck, here are the things we suck at, and we're gonna make these five things better because these are the most important five things and whatnot, and you document that. And then next year you do your assessment, it shows that you did those five things that you said you were going to do, and you're showing a track record of progress, you're showing good faith, and they will actually grant you safe harbor if you're doing it. So this kind of kicks into that whole Chinese uh, pr proverb, when's the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Today. I'll give you another, a great example. This is one of my favorites. There was a, a lab, a, a, a scientific lab in Oregon, and they had a customer who had a burning sensation when he peed, figured he'd better get checked out, right? So he goes and orders a workup for STDs, not realizing that his mother-in-law works at this lab. She sees his order go across the desk. She has a chat with her daughter. He has a very awkward time at dinner the next night and poof, now we have a lawsuit and a HIPAA audit going against the lab. And nothing happened. Nothing happened to them. There was no actions taken, there were no fines levied, there was no lawsuit. Because 
they were papered up. They'd done the HIPAA thing right. They were actually a compliance group client. So that mother-in-law had been trained in Jan at the beginning of the year on the privacy rule, what is and what is not acceptable. She had agreed that she would not disclose private information. She had promised that she wouldn't. She had attested to it formally, and it was all uploaded in the portal, and they had all of these things that could prove when she had taken the training and that she had acknowledged everything. So it's not the lab's problem that she decided to go and break the law and be a rogue employee and be malfeasant. That's not the lab's fault. So the court said, sorry, lab, you're in good shape. Hey, buddy, good luck suing your mother-in-law. Have fun with that. It's going to be awkward Thanksgiving. So the point of this is start where you start and start whenever you can, because it's a crawl, walk, run, fly approach to HIPAA. Um, and we've already gone through this ourselves. There's a, there's a reason why I'm kind of new on the scene here. None of you all have seen me speaking or anything. And that's because to be HIPAA compliant is an enormously big deal. We've been in business for almost 18 years. And I did not want to represent ourselves in this HIPAA space until I was absolutely confident that we could pull it off. Because there's a lot of confusion in the IT space because... Uh, it's easy to confuse normal people into believing you because the definition of an expert is somebody that has one more fact than you. So we really wanted to put our money where our mouth is, and we took years to build out our security team and our security stack to be able to do that. And again, to get this seal of compliance, which is what you ultimately would want to earn, um, if you have that, they will defend you in an audit, they will defend you in legal actions, and they've never lost. So. You can pick that up at the walk stage. You don't have to be all the way through, the, through the, the fly. If you're doing the things like we said, and you're showing good faith, and you're doing the things that you're supposed to do, and documenting it as you go, then you can earn this seal. You can put it on your website. It demonstrates your patients that you care. It demonstrates your employees that you care. And it demonstrates to the attorneys that you care. Because again, if you're not compliant, you're complacent. So coming to the end here, I got some free stuff for all of y'all. If you want, I would appreciate it if you'd follow, follow us on YouTube. That's where we put a lot of our uh, non-boring cybersecurity stuff. It's free. Share it with your employees. And you know, they might be singing a song before long and talking about how they're keeping you safe. Because ultimately, they're, they're the ones that are going to bring you down. So we focus on them. Um, another one here, we have a list. We send out a weekly non-technical uh, cybersecurity tip. Um, I encourage you all to sign up for it. They're very short, and we get great feedback all the time from the people that they're actually useful, they're helpful, and people enjoy them. Again, that's the same uh, QR code for, our, uh, for the YouTube channel, but we have our podcasts are being posted there. Um, so far, we've had an interview with uh, a practice manager, CEO, who led them through COVID and into a successful exit where they were able to sell their business practice, they were able to sell the practice and get a lot more money for it than they would have if they hadn't gone and done all of these things in advance. And then that's my podcast, so subscribe to that. Same thing on the YouTube channel, look for the album to drop this, this year. Uh, it's gonna be a, a, lot of, a lot of fun. And then at our booth, we're having a drawing. Um, if you'll set up a 10 minute consult with your board certified cyber technologist, me, uh, we'll give you four pack of beer and an entry to win an iPad Pro at the end of the show. So um, slightly less free, we're doing a, a show special. If any of you are interested in penetration tests, which cybersecurity insurance, you've probably seen these questions on cybersecurity insurance policies. We're doing a show special of 80% off on that. So come and talk to us up there. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Right. Yep, we did all right. Yeah, if there are there any questions, let's, let's have questions. Yep. We got time. Did you pull yep. a lockdown after that? Did you all lockdown access for staff to, for email and Google and all of those things that to, keep to, us up at night worrying about things? To a certain extent, yes. Um, uh, still, they're able to go to some websites. Um, but, but yes, we did lock down certain things they cannot do. We also started, we weren't doing phishing tests. So, you know, fake, fake emails, trying to get them to click um, and see who, who does it. We do that quarterly now and get reports. And the doctors are the worst. They'll click on, and not only do they click on it, you know, the email, but then they'll click on the free Amazon gift card and put in all their information. So um, we started doing that. Um, you know, I, I think we need to go, maybe all, some of y'all have moved to just uh, an intranet where employees just can email within, they can't go outside unless there's certain people that need to contact insurance companies. I, I, we haven't done that yet, but we 
feel like that might be another way. I mean, that's probably 80% of our people don't need to email the outside world. Um, one of the things we, we, I have a pediatric practice, and one of the things <clears> we did was we have a secure and a semi-secure access. And what we did is we had people who Not on your Wi-Fi. Well, we're finding a lot of pushback, a lot of whining, and, and kind of going through that five stages of grief right now. Uh huh. The email thing is uh, is one of the stickiest because I don't care what anybody says. Almost everybody in this environment has some sort of EPHI in their email. Somebody's going to email you something, you know. And if you've ever received it, and now if you if your cell phone is not a fully managed device according to the requirements of HIPAA. Now you're getting, if their email is on their cell phone, now they have EPHI on their cell phone and it's not protected. So it's a very slippery slope. You know, we had, I had a similar one where it was for credit cards, but they asked us, you know, do you keep credit card numbers? I say, no, of course not. We don't keep credit card numbers. It's like, well, do you take credit cards over the phone? Yeah, we take credit cards over the phone. I'm like, do you record your phone calls? Oh, crap. We do record our phone calls. We do have people's credit card information in our, in our, in our recorded calls. Hadn't thought about that. So that's where the, the good thing is, as confusing as it may be or seem, HIPAA tells you what to do. It tells you where, you know, you start by, you identify where does all this EPHI live? Is it on a cell phone? Is it just on your intranet? And then you build controls around that to enforce it. Privacy is security now. You know, I mean, it's kind of been two separate things, but, you know, we've all had that Facebook thing, like, what's the name of the street you grew up on? You know, they're just trying to figure out what your bank reset thing is, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the name of your first pet? Yeah. So. Uh, another thing I did not, I left out, was that um, at the end, it took weeks, but uh, they've got to find out, you know, the ugly was you, your data was extracted, and now you've got to notify thousands of people, you've got to notify the media, all those things, they went through that whole process and found that they did not extract our data anywhere. They just locked it. They want to be known as good hackers, so you pay them. So this was one of the good hackers. So they just locked your data. They didn't take it anywhere. So thankfully, we weren't one who had to report anything. But another thing that you have to think about, when these patients are calling in and you can't do anything for them, they want to know why. And what do you tell your employees to say? You don't want to say your data's been breached and, you know, so you have to have, think about the messaging that you're going to be telling your patients why they can't be seen this week. Um, because then they lawyer up or whatever and they don't, did they take my data? Now I've got to, I'm trying not to have those conversations if nothing really happened. So it's another thing to think about is the messaging if this happens. How do you know that they didn't do anything? So this company, Silence, will look at, your entire network, your files, and they can see where these people, they came and went, where they went, what they touched, and then they can see, did they take anything with them when they left? And they could not prove that they, they did. And they give you a very detailed report so that now if someone did come back, I would have that report to say, no, we did not have a breach. I don't have to report this. Um, to the Department of Health and Human Services, and we move on. So they, they have software that can look at that. Uh, S, is it S or C? Say it again. Silence? Silence. C-Y-L-A-N-C-E. Um, you know, I'm not paid by them, and I, I'm just, they were, they were great. There's probably 15 other companies out there that do this as well, but that's one that I had to deal with. And what's, what's, what I, we find, too, that's interesting in what, what I'm reading about is so silence, like he's talking about, they, just to be clear, they're helping you, but they don't work for you. No. They work for the insurance company. So in the course of when they're doing all this run through with the fine tooth comb to determine was data exfiltrated, what was the extent of things, they're also gathering data that they can compare to your cybersecurity insurance application. Yes. And if they're like, oh, you said you had multi-factor authentication turned on, but the way that they got in was that multi-factor authentication wasn't turned on. They ain't gonna pay that claim. 
Absolutely. And right now, about 50% of cybersecurity insurance claims are being denied outright or reduced in what they're paying out. That's a, that's a great point. Um, if you attest to it on your cybersecurity form and you're not doing it, they're going to deny that claim. Yep. And that's a great way to get fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? It's, it not real, it's, it's the same. I mean, ultimately, if we take a step back and let's look at this through the HIPAA lens, the, the question becomes, where does the data live? And it doesn't matter whether the data lives in the cloud or whether the data lives on your server in your office, it's still your data and you are still required to do whatever it takes to protect it. Now, the way that you would protect data in your office is a little bit different than how you would protect it in the cloud. Um, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to, to each. You know, for instance, the cloud's great because you can reach it from anywhere, like Ukraine. <laughs> you know? So it's, a, it's all a dual-edged sword, but if you focus on going through the processes, the processes will point all these things out because that's what the assessments and the audits are for, is we're identifying where does all the data live, and then we go and do hand-to-hand -hand combat on each of those things to make sure that what those things are are as secure as the law requires. It's kind of a roundabout non-answer, but it is the truth, I'm afraid. And I think the old school mentality just about where the data sits used to be, I want it to be in my office so I can control it. We can do nothing with those servers. I can't go do any, I still need IT to come fix them if they're not working. Power, weather, all those things that we're, our offices typically aren't very good at managing, um, you know, where a data center has redundancies and things. You know, I live in Mobile, there's hurricanes, things like that. I mean, you know, if our office loses power, that's a problem. They have generators and, and, and can keep things up. Um, so, I, you know, that part of it, we've felt better about having it not in our office versus in our office. But Your EMR is, you know, you're, you know, you're on the cloud in your EMR, and you've got multifaceted authentication to log in and so on. What is the... Uh, it's, MFA is not all that it used to be anymore. So they are, what, what happens, I'm going to try not to tell you how to build a clock. When you click on the MFA thing and you do that and it authenticates you, what's happening is they're giving you back, it's not a cookie, but you know, you know what a cookie is in a web browser kind of thing? It's sort of like that. They're giving you a token. And that token is the encryption token by which all of your communication to and from that cloud service goes, whether that's, that's how it works like with your email and with everything. If the bad guys land on your computer, they can lift that token and they can put it on whatever device that they want and then it's you. Um, so we've, we've seen this happen, go from successful login that immediately logs in from an iPhone and from somewhere else, and then off, off they go. So um, just because something isn't in the is, is in the cloud does not mean it's more secure, because I can still land on your network and I can still get to it. And what's even worse now, and I, uh, to, this is a pro tip too, go back and read the terms and conditions of all of your cloud agreements, because they're putting in verbiage in there to push liability back on you. So if somebody goes and hacks into their data center, like directly through them, that's their problem. You know, and you're paying them to secure that. But if somebody hacks into them through you, that not only is that not their fault and is excluded from their liability, but a lot of these agreements now allow them to come back and pursue you for liability because you caused them damages. So it's, it's becoming even more give and take, two-way street. Because um, security is becoming a shared model. There's nobody, you can't outsource it. You know, you still have to own the risk, you still have to own the people, and uh, as long as you do the right things, it, it accommodates all of the, all of the real world situations. Does the bad guy ever get caught? Rarely, rarely. Because, I mean, they're all beyond, they're all in places that are beyond extradition. You know, I mean, how do you get a, 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 a the black cat is, uh, is purportedly a Russian cyber gang. How do you get them? You know, the Russia's not going to help. And the, the, the main purveyors of this stuff are Iran, China, Russia, Ukraine, Nigeria. 
You know, what are you gonna do? Did you have a thought on what happened of that a few days ago about AT and T and Facebook? Is that I know that's a little off the medical thing, but it just seemed their explanation. Yeah, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get me, right? <laughs> um, you know. They all have said that, from what I've seen, that it was not a hacking incident, that it was a screw up. I mean, and these, these, these things do happen, the world's an imperfect place, and it, it's, it's not the first time a technician on his last day of employment has uploaded the wrong thing <laughs> that, that then spread all over the place and took it down. So, you know, I came from the telecom world originally, so the fact that phones work at all ever is a bloody miracle to me, much less that it works all the time everywhere. But it is, you know, it was, I was out of town. I was actually, my mom had a cardiologist appointment and I was trying to find this cardiologist, I'd never been there, and without a phone. How do you do that? <laughs> I mean, where do you, you pull over and get a map? Where do you get a map? So it was, yeah, I mean, we're really dependent on these things and when, you don't have them. I mean, it's kind of like nobody knows how to paper chart anymore, right? So if, you're, if your systems are down, what do you do? I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. China is not our friend. I'll tell you that. Yes, ma'am. I see. Interesting. So update your business associated agreements is the lesson. If our data was not correctly hacked, but our clearinghouse was, the policy would be paid. Oh, I see. So you're. So to paraphrase for the, for the group, what, what you're saying is be sure that your insurance covers third parties because in the change healthcare example, it was not your data that was taken, it was theirs, mm -hmm. but you're still, you can't say you're not being affected by it. So that's one of the exclusions. I actually have a good friend of mine who is, he's really weird, he loves reading insurance policies. So if any of y'all have a cybersecurity insurance policy and you want, I'll pass it to him, he like loves it. He'll be happy to read it and compare um, what you got to what's out in the market and, and give y'all some, some free insights on that, be happy to. So the, the, the practice, practice mal, malpractice insurance may also have business interruptions? Okay, good to know, I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Obviously we have changed health and we learned a lot. Yeah, a wise man once told me, you know, uh, God gave us shins so you can find furniture in the dark, but you remember where that coffee table is once you whack it a couple of times. So <laughs> you pay for your education one way or another. All right, well, thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time, attention, and interest. And uh, let's make Alabama not number one, okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Phishing emails, but if one's received, they taught all of our folks how not to be deceived. And it's no name, never. No name, never, no more. Shall I fall free to hackers? Onboarding is easy, response time is great, all service included for one monthly rate. If you're worried to hackers, you'll someday succumb, just go visit our site, sipoasis.com.